And man, I appreciate all of our people that volunteer and serve here in our church. Uh, our worship team, man, they did a great job today. Our tech team, all of those in guest services, all those that are in the back, allowing us to have our service uninterrupted, taking care of our children, the nursery, uh, just so many people that uh, serve and make this possible. Thank you so much. I want you to know that I appreciate it. But what's more, you need it. You say, what do you mean? Well, whenever we're able to give back to God, not just money, but our time, our talent, uh, God blesses us for that. And so I am very thankful for everyone. Well, last week we began talking about overcoming performance-driven, I'm sorry, yes, uh, overcoming guilt-driven Christianity, what we talked about last week. Today, we're going to talk about overcoming performance-driven Christianity, kind of a continuation. We're in this series during the summer in the book of Colossians, and we're going through this book looking at what uh, the Word of God has to say to us. And there are a lot of very helpful things that we've already seen. We're looking at who we are in Jesus Christ. Now, when I talk about overcoming performance driven Christianity uh, in religious circles or theological circles, this will be what we would call legalism. Legalism. Now, I know that for some of you that probably doesn't mean anything, but legalism, if I can define it, there's a couple of ways to define it. One is that you add works as being necessary for salvation. That's legalism, okay? In other words, if you think, that, like most Americans think, the way to go to heaven, the way to be right with God is by being good, by keeping the Ten Commandments. That is what is called legalism. And most religions, in fact, all religions in the world other than Christianity, and even many Christians are deceived by this, they all believe that the way that you are made right with God, the way that you get saved, the way you go to heaven is by being good. I want you to understand, and I don't want to misspeak, and I want you to hear me when I say this very clearly. Jesus did not come to make you moral. You say, wait a minute, pastor. Are not Christians supposed to be moral people? Absolutely. God's not against morality. In fact, he's for it. But the reason Jesus came was not to make you shine up real pretty on Sunday morning and get a gold star when you go to school and get a thumbs up from your boss. God did not send his son, Jesus, to make you moral. He came to bring dead things to life. And that's what he does for us. And so that's one aspect of legalism. Another aspect of uh, legalism is this um, false idea once again, legalism adding works to salvation, that's false religion. But uh, many Christians, because it's so pervasive and it's so easy to fall into this, because by, as humans, we are uh, performance driven. When you work hard, we teach our children, then you get ahead. And that's true. You should work hard. You should do your best. When you try your best, when you uh, put in more effort than other people, you'll tend to get ahead, especially in sports or in your job. Obviously, you need to work on your marriage. The harder you work at it, typically the better it is. So by nature, we are performance-driven, right? We are driven by merit. But when it comes to our relationship with God, God's not against effort, He's not against you trying. He's not against determination, but he is completely against your thinking that it is your morality, your goodness, your works that make you in right standing with God. So there are two aspects of it. One is that you add works uh, to become a Christian. And the other is that you add works to become a good Christian. 
In other words, to be sanctified, to use a theological word. Sanctification just simply means that you're growing spiritually. It means that you're set apart. It means that you're becoming more like Jesus. And what happens is we become driven by performance-driven Christianity. Now, here's the problem. Several problems with it. Number one, the Bible blasts this kind of approach to Christian living. Not just blast it, it says it's wrong. It says it's sin. And the problem is, for most of us, it becomes confusing because we think, well, I've got to be a good person. Do you need to be a good person? Yes. Do you need to keep the Ten Commandments? Yes. Don't leave here saying, well, the pastor said we don't need to keep the Ten Commandments to get right with God, which is true. But that doesn't mean that you should go out and steal or go out and commit murder or go out and lie to your neighbor. No, no, no. That's not what God's saying. What he's saying is when I depend completely on myself, that's what we mean when we talk about legalism. So um, it nullifies the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. It nullifies the work of Jesus. It's patently unbiblical. And here's the problem. When a person begins to approach Christianity on their own goodness. In other words, it's my determination. It's my effort. It's my goodness. Well, that leads to some problems. It leads to pride. It leads to judgmentalism, a critical spirit. And in fact, not only is it not spiritual, it's patently unspiritual. Now, that's the hard thing to get our head around because, once again, when you get saved, should you be a good person? Yes. But your goodness doesn't come from you. It comes from Jesus. And that's what you must understand. Should you serve God with your life? Should you give him your time, your talent, your treasure? Yes. But the point is this. When I approach Christianity based on man-made rules then I'm missing the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. And as we're going to read today, we're going to find out that we're going to get frustrated. It'll cause division in the church. It'll create hypocrisy and anger in your life because the fact is you know in your own heart that your performance is a failure. I mean, look, if I depended on this in my own life and I preach against anger and yet I go and lose my temper, which I've done, okay, um, then in my heart, even though I stand up here, if I'm not depending on the righteousness of Jesus Christ, when I stand up here and I'm giving you a moral lecture rather than the Word of God, then I become hypocritical. And what it begins to do in my heart, it begins to erode away my confidence in Jesus Christ. Why? Well, it's like the old steamship. Many years ago, the story is told that this steamship, they would do a fresh coat of paint on the pipe that drove this steamship. You know what I'm talking about with a steamship, right? And uh, had the pipe in the middle of it and the steam would come out and it would make the ship go. Well, for many years, they would put a fresh coat of paint on the outside of it, not really paying much attention to the inside of the pipe. And one day, someone hit this pipe accidentally, and the entire thing collapsed. And what they discovered is that the salt air, the sea air, had corroded the steel, the metal on the inside of that pipe, and all that was left was a shell of paint. And when someone hit it, it collapsed. You know, there are a lot of Christians that are like that. When you depend on your own works and it's performance-driven Christianity, you're just like that steam pipe. You've got the outward look and everybody looks at you and they say, boy, he is a good person. Boy, she is very good person. And then when the truth comes out about what you struggle with, People are surprised because often what happens to us is that we become a, a person that will put up walls. We'll put up uh, this pretend facade. And 
That's why the Bible tells us to share our burdens with one another and to confess our faults to one another. Because Christianity operates best in the light of Jesus Christ, not in the darkness of your performance. Because what happens to us is we, we hide. And because we know that we failed, even though we've got this persona, we know in our heart that we're being hypocritical. And so what do you do about that kind of relationship with God, this performance-driven kind of relationship? Well, before I read in Colossians, let me read to you uh, from 2 Timothy chapter 3, 5. I'm going to read from two translations. Here's what it says. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Man, that's a stern warning, is it? They act religious. We all know people like that. But rather than tapping into the power of the Holy Spirit, rather than tapping into the power of God, we just trust ourselves. And he said, they act religious, but they deny the power of God in their life. And then I'll read from the Living Bible. It says, they will go to church, yes, but they won't really believe anything they hear don't be taken in by people like that. Boy, isn't, there, isn't that the truth? So many times we go to church, but we don't act on what we hear. We don't really believe it. Oh, we say we believe it. But if you believe it, it changes your heart. It changes your attitude. It changes your approach. So understand what I'm talking about today is not a performance-driven uh, type of Christianity but rather a relationship with Jesus Christ, a dynamic, growing, real relationship with Jesus that you know you're not perfect, you know that you don't get everything right, but you know that you're forgiven. You know that you're in right standing with God, not because of your performance, but because of your grace. I think maybe one of the ways that I can illustrate this before I get into reading the text is as a parent, you love your child no matter what their performance is. One of my favorite things to do is to watch children in church plays or sometimes school plays. And they are patently awful, all right? I mean, normally you watch them and you're like, oh my goodness, but when it's your child up there, that, I mean, people are filming it. They're recording it. They love it. And it's, it's very entertaining. It's very funny watching what kids do. Do you know why? Because a parent is not holding their child in bondage to saying, you know what? You better get your lines right. You better not miss a note on that song. You know why? Because they're not worried about the performance. They're worried about their relationship with their child. And in the same way, your heavenly father loves you. And he's not looking at your life like you're on some stage. And if you mess up your lines, if you goof up, then he's going to disown you. He's going to be embarrassed by you. No, your heavenly father is just like you are with your children. It's not dependent upon your performance, but it's dependent upon your relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, let me read from what the Apostle Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 2. He said, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. You see, let me explain. In this church, they were struggling because there were people that were saying, You know what? You're not a good Christian because you eat stuff that is forbidden by law. Now, remember, many of these people were Jewish converts to Christianity. And for many of them, their old way of living by the law carried over. And when they talked about food, a couple of the main things about the Jewish dietary laws were that they couldn't eat pork and they couldn't eat shrimp or things like that. You can count me out. All right, I got to have some bacon and some shrimp is all I'm saying. But the fact is, there were people in this church that were saying, you're not a good Christian because you're not doing this or this that we have done and keeping certain festivals. And then Paul wrote, wrote he said, these are a shadow of the things to come. In other words, they, they're a picture of Christ, 
They're not the substance, but the substance belongs to Christ. So our eyes are to be on Jesus, not on some religious ceremony. Let no one disqualify you. Let me ask you a question. You ever disqualified somebody? Sometimes we disqualify people just by the way they look, don't we? Well, they don't look like a person that should belong to this church, and therefore we judge them by their outward appearance. The Bible says that's wrong. Or maybe we disqualify somebody because they do something that we don't think they should do. Maybe it's something that is our preference, and we say, hey, you know what? I don't do that. They shouldn't do it. We disqualify them. And then he says, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels. Asceticism is physical abuse, causing pain, as if somehow or another this would get you right with God. There are many Christians throughout the world that still do this today. You ever seen one of those movies where uh, maybe a priest or a monk beats themselves with a whip or they, they punish themselves? That's asceticism. Or maybe you see people that will crawl on their knees to go maybe into a church or to pray before uh, a crucifix and they get their knees bloody. That's asceticism. And what they think is, because I'm torturing myself, because I'm inflicting pain on my body, God must love me more. Well, that's not only not true. God could not love you any more than he does, no matter what you do or don't do. That's called asceticism. And it says, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind. Now, does God give visions? Yes. But what he's describing here is people that want to elevate their experience above what the Word of God says or their experience above um, the kind of Christian living that God has called us to. Now, does God give visions? Yes. Uh, maybe he's given you one. I've had visions uh, before, and then there have been times that I've just had bad dreams, okay? You know, sometimes uh, maybe it's not that God gave me a vision. Maybe I just ate too much pizza before I went to bed, all right? Now, my point is this. Can God speak through visions? Absolutely. But his, his point here is that it is really easy to get caught up in this kind of stuff and really miss the main point of Christianity, we talk about all these experiences, but he said, not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, talking about Jesus, nourished and knit together uh, through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. All right, so see what he's saying. You either are going to be this kind of person that judges others based on your experience, you're going to hold others to an accountability that is not found in the Bible. You're going to say that person is not spiritual because they do this and I do not do this. Therefore, they're not very spiritual. Or he says, you can keep your eyes on Jesus Trust in Jesus as the head of the church and experience a growth that is from God. Now, it's the choice that you have to make. Which one do you want? Do you want a real, dynamic, transparent relationship with God? One that, yes, it admits that you're not perfect. Yes, you realize that others are not perfect. But you're not walking around as a holier-than-thou kind of person. But rather, you know that God has forgiven you, and therefore you're going to give grace to others. You're not going to get in fights over silly things, and you're not going to argue about silly stuff. What you're going to do is you're going to experience a growth that comes from God. Man, what a choice. Well, he goes on. He says, if, Christ, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, talking about demonic things, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? And then you'll notice this next sentence is in quotes. It was a very popular saying when Paul wrote this. There was a group of people that had this mantra, and here's what they said. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. A lot of Christians kind of have that mantra, don't they? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. 
and, and we come up with silly things that Christians argue over. I mean, for example, uh, some Christians argue over music, the style of music, as if God is not a creative God, that God doesn't enjoy many different styles. Of course he does. He invented it. He came up with it. He created it. All right? So don't argue over silly things. Do not handle, do not touch, do not taste. By the way, this is adding to what the Bible says. You know that that happened in the Garden of Eden, right? Remember when uh, Satan tempted Eve? And God had said to her, do not eat, and to Adam, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because the, you, you do, you're going to die. And you know what the devil, he, in his questioning, added to the word of God. He added, you should not even touch. In fact, Eve is, also said this, said you don't eat it, but you don't even touch it. God didn't say don't touch it. He said don't eat it, don't disobey and the point is this, you can't add to the Word of God and say something that the Bible doesn't say to try to make a person seem more spiritual because that is not a dynamic love relationship with God. That is a rules-driven, hate-filled, pride-inflicting kind of malady that affects us in our relationship with God. And so, he said, some of you are saying, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they're used. And by the way, in case you're wondering what he's saying here, I'm going to get real plain with you for a second because what he's saying here, talking about stuff that's used, he's talking about you eat stuff and you poop it out. Now, that's what he thought about that kind of approach to Christianity. He said, look, uh, it's useful in a way, but you're going to, you got to go to the bathroom. You get rid of it. Uh, it and, and, and so he's pretty clear as to what we should and should not do. He said, according to human precepts and teachings, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity of the body. By the way, all this type of Christianity has an appearance of being good. It has an appearance, well, I'm a good Christian because, you know, you fill in the blank of whatever it is you think you should or shouldn't do. Many of you know that I grew up on a tobacco farm in North Carolina. My grandparents were tobacco farmers. And I remember many, many preachers where I grew up preaching against tobacco. Now, most of them that had tobacco farmers in their church didn't preach against it because that's where their money came from. So you weren't going to talk about the cash crop, right? But I can remember people talking about, you know, how that, you know, working in tobacco was a sin. And I'm like, hmm, where does that say that in the Bible? It doesn't. And, and this is the kind of thing he's talking about. He said, there are some things that have an appearance of wisdom. They have an appearance of spirituality. There are groups that say you shouldn't drink coffee because it's got caffeine in it. I do not happen to be a part of that group. I had two cups of coffee this morning, all right? Now, you say, well, do you drink decaf? No, I do not, all right? I don't see the point of drinking coffee if it doesn't have caffeine in it, all right? And, and, and so, his, do you get what he's saying here? That if we're not careful we will make something uh, a mark of spirituality that isn't. He said, they have an appearance of wisdom, but they are of no value, listen to this, in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Now, herein lies the key to understanding this. He says that all of this piled on religious stuff, this performance-driven Christianity, he said it doesn't do anything to stop the indulgence of your old wicked flesh. Now, when you get saved, you get a new nature. God puts the Spirit of God in you, so you have a new nature, but you still have the old nature, okay? So you got two that fight within you all the time, all right? And so what he's saying here is this. The way that you overcome the old flesh, the way that you overcome that old attitude, that old sin 
nature, that giving in to the anger, that giving in to the things that bind you, the things that um, you need deliverance from. The, 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 the way that you overcome it is not through this asceticism, this punishing in the flesh, this idea that you are to beat yourself up, this idea that you are to be performance-driven. He said that doesn't do anything to make you more spiritual. Now, like I said, there are many people that think they're in spiritual graduate school that are actually in spiritual kindergarten. Because when you approach Christianity from this standpoint, which is a problem then, it's a problem now, then he says, you're not doing anything to become a better Christian. Oh, yeah, you may stop some habits. You may not smoke, dip, or chew, or run with girls that do. You know, maybe you avoid going to certain places. He said, but the truth of the matter is, inside, you still got that old sinful nature what is more important, by the way? Some style that you think is wrong or the attitude of the heart, the kindness of Jesus Christ in your life? What's more important that you don't dress in a certain way or that you are kind to people, that you share the love of Jesus Christ, that you let God transform your language? What's more important? that we go to church and we get seen so that we check the box or coming home and cussing your wife out over every little thing that happens. Here's the point. Don't miss it. God says that this kind of approach is of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. How do you get delivered from these things? How do you get control of your temper? How do you get deliverance from that addiction that you have in your life? How do you have a better attitude? How do you love people like God tells us to love them? How do you have a better attitude on life, a better outlook on life? It's not by this whole list of rules, but it's about trusting in the dynamic work of Jesus Christ. Well, I realized that I spent a long time developing this, okay? I've got three points, but don't worry, they won't be very long, all right? And you can write them down if you have the notes and you'd like to take notes. There are three things I want you to see from what Paul told us in this passage. Number one, don't be deceived by your performance. Don't be deceived by your performance. In other words, don't depend on it. Don't depend on your strength. Now, are some people stronger than others? Yes. Should you have determination? Absolutely. But don't depend on your ability to be determined to deliver you because it won't. Oh, there are some people that are more successful than others in determination, but he's saying you're trusting in the wrong thing. What happened to these people was that they did two things when they trusted in their own flesh. They disqualified people based on observance of ritual law, and they judged people. They, they judged and they disqualified. Oh, she could never do anything. If people knew what she was really like, boy, I tell you what, they wouldn't let her come to this church. Well, that's why we say things like, this is a perfect place for imperfect people. Because the truth is, no one here is perfect. And, and we don't get spiritual by just simply uh, keeping a list of rules. By the way, like I said before, they were, it was pervasive in this church, okay? Not this church, but the church at Colossae, Colossae that Paul was writing to. And um, the fact is, they really struggle with this. Now, were there any benefits at all to the ritual observance of the Old Testament law? Well, the reason that the dietary laws were there was for your health. I mean, it doesn't take a medical professional to understand if I eat a pound of bacon every morning for breakfast and I drink, you know, a glass of bacon fat at lunch and uh, I have sausage at night, you're probably going to have heart disease, okay? So when God says, 
to the Israelites that, you know, avoid the pork. Uh, that was not for their spiritual admonition. It was for their physical health. So is there value in eating properly for your health? Absolutely. But do not think that makes you more spiritual. That's what he's saying. So the observance of diet and days. Um, so don't be distracted or deceived by your performance. That's not what makes you right with God. Number two, don't be distracted from Christ's performance. In other words, the performance that matters is not your performance, but Jesus' performance. I love that the writer of Hebrews told us that Jesus is the anchor for our souls. Now, what does an anchor do? It holds you during the storm. An anchor does its best work during the storm. And the anchor's job is to hold you. It's not your job to hold it. Jesus is the one that we need to worry about what his performance was. And his performance was perfect. Paul wrote there, he said, not holding fast to the head. This was people, this was a group of people in this church. They weren't prioritizing the performance of Jesus Christ. They were not living by the grace of God. Now, let me just encourage you. The more you rest in the grace of God, the more spiritual you're going to be. You say, well, that, how does that work? I don't really know, to be honest. I just know it works. When you become sin-focused, you ever been that? Oh, I got this sin. Uh, I got to just, I got to overcome it. And you think about it, and the more you think about it, the more you do it. When you stop looking at that and you start looking at the performance of Jesus Christ, he died for me, he cleansed me, he forgave me of all my sins, and you start thinking of that and you think of that, you're going to wake up one day and realize you haven't thought about that sin that you used to do in a month. God begins to deliver you. So worry about the performance of Jesus. Our sufficiency is in Christ, not in our rituals or our deeds. And then here's the last thing. Don't be defeated by trusting in performance. There are a lot of Christians that live a defeated life. Let me read again what he said. These indeed have an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. You want to live free? You want to live blessed? You want to have a relationship with Jesus Christ that so completely transforms your life? I, I grew up in the performance-driven kind of Christianity. And I know after a while that it got very burdensome, very heavy. I didn't know if I was going to make it. Probably wouldn't have. But when I began to focus on Jesus and understand the grace of God, that it's freely given, I don't earn it. I don't do anything to keep it. God gives, therefore it's called grace because I don't deserve it. It's unearned. When I do that, the more I rest in that grace, the freer I become. It's astounding in my life. The sins that I struggle with, the more I focus on the grace of God, the freer I am from them. That's the work of God in my life. And you know what else? I'm happier. I'm happier I have joy in my life. It allows me whenever I go through difficult times. And by the way, you will. I've been through difficult times. Those of you who have been a part of this church, you've seen my struggle over the last three years or so with they don't even really know what happened to me. But I was in a wheelchair and couldn't get out of bed. And, uh, but God began slowly to heal me and get me better and better and better. There was a point about a year or so in that I was, um, I, I came to this point in my life that so completely was I focused on the grace of God. I wasn't angry. I wasn't ticked at God because he let me go through something bad that I didn't think I deserved. But I came to a point in my life where I said, God, and, and I'm telling you, it's probably one of the first times in my life that I was able to do something like this over something that was so big, I actually literally thanked God that I went through what I was going through because I knew it was making me a better Christian. I knew it was making me a better pastor. Now, I got to tell you, 
I have more joy. I'm happier in my relationship with Jesus Christ than I ever, ever, ever was when I was driven by my performance. And you can have that freedom in Christ as well. He says that he forbade this kind of Christianity and he encouraged us to live in the freedom and the grace of God. Don't be driven by that, but be driven by the grace of God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the fact that you sent Jesus to die for us on the cross to save us, to forgive us, to justify us, to make us right with God. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to realize that it's not our works, it's not our performance that matters, but it's yours. Help us to rest in that. I pray that you give our people freedom in Christ, joy in the Lord, the ability to have that relationship with God that is so dynamic that it changes their life. Before I finish my prayer, I wonder today if you would say, Pastor, I need, I need that. God's spoken to me today. Maybe the Holy Spirit spoke to you about something. Maybe he spoke to you about something in your life that I talked about today. But you say, Pastor, I need prayer that you'd help me, that God would help me not to pursue performance-driven Christianity, but rather to pursue Jesus. Anybody like that, raise your hand while no one's looking. God bless you. I pray that God will open your heart and your mind where you can do this. Then maybe there are some watching online or in the room that would say, Pastor, I need, I need to be saved. I need Jesus. I, I've always thought that the way to go to heaven is to be a good person, and I've tried to be really good. But God's Word showed me that I can't be good enough, and I need God's help. Well, if that's you today, here's what the Word of God says, that if you'll call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. Not might be, not occasionally, not most people will be, but you will be saved. You say, Pastor, I want that. Why don't you pray something like this? Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe you resurrected and are alive today. I'm asking you right now to come into my heart, to change me. I ask you to be the Lord and the leader of my life, to forgive me of my sins. If you'll say something like that to God today, I want you in the room to fill it out on the next step card. If you're online, and our online audience uh, the last week or so has been growing, Maybe you would just go to the bottom and click that button that lets us know that you pray to receive Christ as well today. Father, we love you today. We thank you for all that you're doing in us. And God, we pray that you bless our people. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Well, before you leave today, let me remind you of a couple things. One, we will be having a next step class for those that are interested coming up soon. Uh, I don't recall the date off the top of my head, but uh, it's going to be coming up uh, soon, probably next month, okay? So if you'd like to take that next step, then you can do that um, and go through that class. It's 30 minutes. It's during the service. I teach it, and then when we're done, you can come in here and uh, participate in the rest of the service. So if you'd like to do that, sign up on the next step card so we can put you in that workflow, okay? If you'd like to be involved in a small group, we'll start those back up in August. Uh, if you'd like to get involved in a ministry, you can see us or you can write on that next step card. That next step card is important to communicate. If you have a prayer request or something of that nature, put it on there, drop it in the drop box on the way out. Or today, if you would like to pray with one of our prayer team members, they're here to serve you. And uh, they're to my left, to your right on the way out. And they'll be there to pray with you. Uh, whatever your need, doesn't matter what it is. You don't have to be a member of the church. 
Uh, it's just that you want somebody to pray with you about something. It could be finances. It could be family. Uh, it could be your health. It could be your job. It doesn't matter what it is. If you'd like to pray with them, they're here to serve you. Okay? All right. Well, I think that's it. All right. Let's everyone stand. Find three people before you leave today. Look them in the eye and say, you look good today. God bless you. Have a great, great Sunday. I'll see you next week.